Hello everyone and welcome. I'm here at Champions Weekend at Covenant Tulsa. I'm joined by my esteemed guest, <laughs> Michael Boggs, also known as Boggs. Boggs, I'm just going to start calling you Boggs. Yeah, Last night easier. I called you Michael slash Boggs, <laughs> uh, which uh, may be the first time ever. Uh, but Michael, you're one of the first, or one of the three original designers of Marvel Champions yeah. ECG. Uh, we appreciate you coming out. Thank, shout out to the FFG for allowing you to come and sending you mm -hmm. um, and providing us with a bunch of previews, which we'll be talking about in a minute, all the Captain America cards specifically. Uh, so I have a list of questions. We did a, Q a kind of private Q&A last night at the event. Yeah, yeah uh, We answered, fun. I'll be asking some of those questions, but then if you're on the chat right now and you've ever wanted to ask a designer of a game that you play a question, now is your chance. Um, I'll be going through and picking out best questions. Be sure you include a question mark because that's the only way I can basically search for and find the questions in the chat. Uh, as those things start rolling on. And uh, we'll hang out and answer questions for a little bit, and then we'll be about our way. We'll go back to actually hanging out and playing the game, which <laughs> I'm excited about doing. So first off, I'm going to kick it off with a question. Um, can you give me a s synopsis, as you tell, weave me a tale of your journey from uh, you know, not being a, a known game designer to the Marvel Champions LCG fame that you're now claiming? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of it was just uh, sheer luck. Uh, I lived in uh, South Korea for about five years after I graduated from university. The whole time I was there, I did a lot of independent game development. I had a lot of ideas that I'd work on that I thought were cool. Um, during that time, I played a lot of Android Netrunner, for anyone that's heard of that. Uh, and kind of those two things, my love of LCGs and kind of the past experience that I had just working my own stuff, um, culminated into me getting offered a uh, position at Fantasy Flight Games. I saw a, an opening online, decided to apply, and they accepted me for the position. So, so you got uh, thrown into Netrunner as your first game. Yeah, thrown into <laughs> Netrunner as my first game. No first pressure. Day I started. I was told that I was the lead developer on it, um, and uh, worked on that for a little bit. Uh, that eventually ended. Um, from there, I moved on to Star Wars Destiny for a bit. I helped with uh, Keyforge for a bit. Uh, and then uh, I eventually made my way onto the Marvel Champions LCG. And now we're here. Now we're here. Uh, and so a brief, can you give me a brief history? What was your Marvel uh, appreciation slash fandom like prior to working on this game? I, uh, I always grew up liking Spider-Man and uh, X-Men, the cartoons specifically when I was young. I used to watch those a lot. Um, and as I got older, I didn't read the comic books so much, but... Spider-Man specifically, I always really liked him as a hero. Uh, out of all the heroes in the world, he was the one. Spider-Man cartoon is pretty legit. Oh yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. All of those cartoons are really fun. Um, but the the very first Spider-Man movie that they came out mm. with uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Tobey Maguire, I really like that movie. Um, and just just Spider-Man in general, there was there was always something about him that was he felt very human, and he felt like I could relate to him. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of continued to follow Marvel just sort of um, uh, almost like in an ancillary position. I'd watch the movies and stuff, but I wasn't wasn't like a hardcore Marvel fanatic. Not like a comic person. Exactly. Not not so much. I liked the comics, the few that I had read, but I didn't I didn't read them very frequently. Um, and it wasn't until we actually started working on Marvel that I was like, oh, I should probably learn more about the comics. That might be helpful. So uh, I started reading some then, and I sort of discovered a passion for how much I really do enjoy the comics. Yeah, that's really cool. What an opportunity. Yeah. Right? All right, uh, we're getting a lot, of, a lot of questions rolling in, so I'm going to start asking some of those, and cool. we'll kind of just go with the flow of the chat here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Jennifer Walters, I object. Can it be used during scheme setup before the player phase to remove place threat on a scheme like defense network in the claw scenario? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't think I've actually seen that come up before. Um, Let me ask you a deep rules question, not give you a rule book or any time to prepare. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say... <laughs> Nailed it. So generally, whenever a scheme comes into play, if it comes into play with a certain amount of threat on it... It's not being placed. It's not being placed. It just enters. If it says specifically to place the threat, though, then yeah, her ability should Because is work. she in play as the setup's happening? I believe she would be, yeah. I, I think okay. I'd have to look at the specific setup rules, but... I'm pretty sure one of the very first rules is to choose your hero and put that into play. If the scheme, were, I'd, I'd have to look at them specifically, <laughs> but my answer is if the scheme is put gotcha. on the board before she is, then it won't. Yeah. But if she's in play and but threat yeah, is actually placed, trigger, yeah. then I, I think it should probably work. All right. If someone in the chat knows better, uh, we'll find that as we go. Yeah, these if I can look at the rules, I would yeah. know for sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we won't take that time. <laughs> uh, Let's see, Brennan is asking, could we ever see a character that attacks or thwarts while in alter ego form or a character that recovers in hero form? Yeah, uh, I think that's definitely design space that we might explore. Um, 
Uh, I could definitely see, you know, some character um, maybe who can recover a lot or something having that be their special. Even on the hero side. Well, even yeah. on the hero side. So that, that's interesting. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. These some, this, I like some of these questions. Um, at what point did you guys come up with the hero slash alter ego game mechanic during designing the game? It was relatively early on. Uh, we, I forget who exactly suggested it, but at some point somebody was like, oh, it'd be really cool if you could, you know, have an alter ego side and kind of play with that because I think Marvel is so defined for a lot of people by the actual human characters that are attached to these heroes. Like I said, Peter Parker was always the reason that I love Spider-Man so much. So um, it kind of came about in some sort of conversation, some sort of suggestion that it would be really cool to be able to play as the alter ego. Uh, and everyone on the development team thought that was a really interesting idea. So um, we decided to explore that and liked it so much that we kind of built the entire game around the mechanic. Yeah, it seems like one of those North Star type mechanics. Exactly, right? yeah. It's just so fundamental really to what's going everything. on. Yeah. Yep. All right, so uh, Max, Hill, Max Heal says, what did your experience designing Netrunner teach you that you applied to champions, or maybe even just card design in general? Uh, I think one of the big things, I tend to really like cards that are pretty straightforward, relatively simple. Uh, if you look at my work on Netrunner, I, I really try to get back to basics. Um, and the reason partially for that is because we were, at the time, we were releasing a revised core. We were anticipating a lot of new players coming in, a lot of people returning, and we didn't want to just flood them with all of these mechanics. But uh, kind of through that development process, I realized that a lot of people just want very simple uh, effects that just do cool things. Like, you don't want to have to read walls of text. So during this entire process of development for Marvel Champions, I think one thing that I always tried to keep in my mind and something that the design team in general tried to keep in mind was just keeping things simple if we could. Uh, keep them simple, but also keep them interesting. Yeah, do something, but not a wall of text. Exactly, if you can avoid it. There are some effects that are gonna need more text than others, but um, we definitely tr always talk about ways to get around that if we can. Sure, that's awesome. I, I appreciate that. I'm also not a as we saw in my, the previous game where I didn't build the scenario right, uh, I'm not the most uh, <laughs> diligent reader. It still reader. worked, though. Yeah. It still worked actually really yeah, well. We, we made it happen. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, when playing, I noticed a lot of similar designs. This is from Jared. From FFG, Lord of the Rings, Netrunner, is that a conscious choice in using what works or just happenstance from your experience? Um, I think to a certain extent, maybe it's a bit of both. I could see it being somewhat unconscious. I, I personally have not played the Lord of the Rings LCG, but I've heard a lot of people compare Marvel to that. That's amazing, yeah. actually. Yeah, I, I, I've, uh, enough people have talked about it at this point that I should probably play it. But Caleb Grace has worked on that for many years, and Nate French designed it, so I could very easily see some things working their way into Marvel, probably subconsciously. So I think a lot of times we'll find something that works, and maybe that thing will work across multiple games. And if it works in one game and it also works in another, then that's, just, that's great. It just allows us to learn lessons and kind of build on what we know is, is good. Do you think because they are so familiar with Lord of the Rings that maybe you not having that perspective is actually helpful in terms of n basically a new way of looking at a thing? Because I, I feel like if I was Caleb or Nate, I could want to basically avoid concepts we explored sure. in the Lord of the Rings or even Arkham. Um, and then you get to Champions and it's like, well, here's a thing that we did and you don't know. Mm -hmm. You haven't experienced this before. So they can kind of see your reaction to it to see if it's something that like, you enjoy sure. versus like they don't they can't ever unexperience it right yeah. they know what it's like to play those things so you think I think that, uh, that has definitely kind of come up it's it's a bit of a double edged sword it's because there are things that are, are sometimes in the game that I'm like oh this is really new and innovative and interesting and I really enjoy it and they're like oh no that was it. actually a uh, uh, Nick Fury the design yeah. of him I didn't know that's how Gandalf works in Lord of the Rings, but the first time I saw Nick Fury, I was like, oh, that's a really cool ally. And Caleb's like, yeah, it's kind of, kind of, I wanted to pay homage to that. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of lessons that Caleb has learned from his experience with Lord of the Rings that I have not learned yet. So um, I think it can definitely help in some ways, but there's always opportunity to kind of grow and explore. Sure. Uh, let's see. What skill did you learn in developing this game that you maybe didn't have before working on Marvel Champions? Hmm. How did, it, oh. how did it make you grow as a designer, I guess? I think it, uh, so before I started working on this Marvel Champions. This is from Champions, Amanda, by the way. Go from ahead. who, I'm sorry? Amanda. Amanda. Before I started working on Marvel Champions, I did not play very many cooperative games. Uh, I had tried a couple cooperative games in the past, and generally my experience, I would run into the alpha gamer problem a lot, where I'd sit down with a game, 
for the first time, and my friend, you know, was experienced in that game, and we'd go to do a turn or a round, and it wasn't really me playing the game, it was kind of my friend directing me on how to play, uh, and so that experience that happened multiple times throughout multiple games always sort of soured cooperative games mm. for me. Um, and it wasn't until I really saw Arkham Horror, the card game, that, so building your deck and kind of having that hand of cards, that it naturally works against that type of alpha gamer moment because I don't know what is the most efficient for you. I don't know what you put in your deck necessarily. And so it really creates a lot of these moments where we have to work together to solve this puzzle instead of just one person directing it. And when I saw how that also played out in Marvel, it was really encouraging. And I, I think uh, for me, I've grown a lot in that I now appreciate the design and development of cooperative games just as much as competitive games. And a lot of times I'll find myself, I used to think about games honestly kind of only competitively. Like those were always the games I was excited about. But now I'll see maybe a new game come out that's cooperative. I'm like, oh, yeah, that I, I see those mechanics. Those are really cool and interesting and fresh, and I want to play those now. So. It's really broadened my horizons, I think. And so it's, it sounds like your history as a player is a little leans heavier to competitive. Yeah. Um, as a designer, do you find that you enjoy or uh, are more interested in the experience of designing for competitive or cooperative more? I think it's uh, for me now. It's a bit of both. If you had asked me probably a year or two ago, I would have said definitely competitive. But um, I find that when you are developing for a competitive game. You, you're always thinking about the meta at large, how every single card is in some ways going to affect every single other card, how you know, if, I, if I make this card for this faction, will it be put in every deck or will anyone even bother to play it at all? I, and I think cooperative games are kind of the opposite of that. It's really for cooperative games, you just want to make fun, fresh cards that people are excited to play. And of course you want to keep the balance on, on par with everything, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's really about making those storytelling moments, those thematic moments, and those moments that people are excite, excited to explore in the game. So um, I think both kind of have merit and both are, are really fun to design for. Yeah, that's cool. I, I feel like it would be a very different challenge. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, this is, a, this is an interesting question. Uh, was, this is from, uh, who, who Zeppelin? Uh, was there ever a fifth aspect in the design process? What made four a strong choice for the number of aspects? For a very uh, relatively short period of time, we explored a fifth aspect. Its color was going to be purple. Uh, the I believe fifth it, element. It was a fifth element. Uh, and we eventually got to a point where we just felt like its identity was not strong enough. Uh, I personally, as a player, have always enjoyed games whenever factions are done. I like when the factions are, there's only a few of them. If there's too many, then I think a lot of times things tend to bleed, yeah. which to a certain extent kind of defeats the point of factions. Um, I really like when they're separate and each one has a very clear play style. So we felt across the board on the design team that the fifth uh, aspect just didn't quite hold itself up like the other ones did. And we decided to take some of its design space and kind of split it amongst split the it other into others. Yeah. Uh, can, you don't have to do this, but can you reveal what that aspect was? We called it determination. It was okay. purple, and it was very much uh, the aspect where you kind of focused on uh, self-sacrifice, uh, uh, hurting yourself with, with damage, or you know maybe discarding cards randomly from your hand to do a thing, which is interesting in theory, but that was really the only thing that it did that was interesting. And we can do those types of things in the other aspects in, in interesting ways. So. Yeah, and do you think the is the role of aspects in this game to basically, uh, you know, in the competitive games, they talk about color pies a lot, mm -hmm. right? Which is like, here's the strengths and weaknesses of each faction, right? Magic, I think, is what started that. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something you're looking to maintain? Because I know a lot of games, as they expand, uh, eventually, right, it's like right now, protection, as an example, can prevent uh, encounter cards and mm -hmm. it can heal damage from characters. But like at some point down the road, it's like, oh, aggression can do that as well. They just do it in this other way. Sure. Um, or justice can do that as well. They just do that in this other way. Um, or are you going to try to maintain kind of a very clear like, this is the this is what this aspect is good at, and this is what it's not so good at. Mm -hmm. I, I think we are very much going to. We want to maintain that separation. We want to make sure that you know, if I sit down to play as Captain America, for instance, and I play him. In leadership, that's going to feel very different than if I play him in aggression, and that's going to feel very different than if I play him in justice. But I think it's also really compelling to give players the option to say, well, I'm playing Captain America 
in an aggression build that works this specific way, and then I'm also playing a Captain America in an aggression build that works this other way. It kind of gives variety within the aspects themselves, but at the end of the day, I think we want each aspect to very much have a specific strength and a specific weakness. Very cool. So uh, here's a question from Brant. He wants to know, do you think the plan will be to release new heroes, just release new heroes, or do you, will you ever be able to go back and add hero cards to existing hero card pools? Uh, we've kind of talked about both options, and I, I think it's really just whatever we feel is best for the individual um, kind of release that we're on, the, the pack that we're on, and uh, I definitely think it's, it's something we could explore. Uh, Norens wants to know, what's your favorite aspect? Oh, my favorite aspect? I tend to really like protection. Why, why, do, you, why do you think that is? I like, I like controlling the board. I like uh, being able to put my stuff out and kind of prevent the damage and um, kind of uh, make sure that I'm always there to help my team as a whole. Like, whenever I play, for instance, other games, any cooperative game, I tend to either be the one that kind of stands up front and gets hit in the face, a tank is what they call it in a lot of games, <laughs> or I'm the one that kind of stands back and heals everybody. The mage. Uh, the mage, exactly, the healer. I'm there. Um, so anytime I can kind of support my party in that way, I really, really enjoy it. Cool. Everyone has a role to play. Yeah. And everyone has a certain role they like to play. All right, Jared wants to know, has Caleb given you his history of X-Men TED Talk? Oh, I'm sure. He's given me so, ted so many TED Talks. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have had lots of hilarious <laughs> conversations. Uh, Volantru wants to know, what are some of your favorite board games you haven't designed? Oh, man. Uh, I really love Seven Wonders Duel. I think that's a really excellent game. I, I find myself always wanting to play that. Um, I like uh, Arkham Horror uh, LCG a lot. Um, I really like... Um, uh, there was the Scythe board game. I mm, like that quite mm -hmm. a bit. I had fun with that. Um, Crazy honestly, art. over the oh yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, over the last few years, I haven't really had the opportunity to play a lot of the newer stuff. I've been pretty yeah. busy. Well, when you it, tell me if this is true, when you work from nine to five on games, does mm -hmm. it make you a lot less inclined to play games in the evenings or weekends? It does for me because I, I find myself now, if I sit down and play a game, there are points where I'll play it and just enjoy it for the sake of the game, but. I have a tendency to start thinking about it as a designer. Mm -hmm. Oh, why does this mechanic work like this, and how does it play into other things? And that's fun for me <laughs> to an extent, but after a little Feels while, like work. yeah, it just it starts to feel like I'm working again. So um, I don't play them as much as I would like, and maybe over time I'll start to try to do it more because sometimes my friends talk about, oh, have you played this in this game? And nine times out of ten, I'm like, oh no, I haven't done that yet. And I think I probably should most of the time, but. It's, it's, a, just, it's a tough balance. Yeah, it really is. It's, yeah. it's tricky. It's, it's hard to sometimes enjoy something casually that you're working on every day. Even if you really love it, it just it, it does become work after a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, so let's see. This is a good question. Uh, when you're approaching design, uh, do you put theme or mechanics first? Oh, we uh, tend to... I think it depends on the specific type of card that you're looking at. If we are developing a hero specific card, uh, it's almost always theme first. We will sit down, talk about who the hero is, talk about you know, how they exist in the universe, and talk about how we're going to represent them mechanically in our game. Um, but at the end of the day, kind of everything that we put into a hero's set of cards are there to strengthen that hero's thematic identity. Whereas if we're making something like aspect cards or basic cards, a lot of times those really come about with conversations of what doesn't exist in the game? What do we want to exist in the game? What play styles do we think should come about? Um, and I think we, we try to, there's a little bit of bleed on both sides. Sometimes we just want a hero to do something cool, so we'll think of this mechanical thing and tie thematics in that way. And sometimes for aspect cards, we'll do the opposite, where we'll see like a really cool piece of art or think of a really cool moment, and we're like, oh, let's build a mechanic around that. But most of the time, we kind of split it based off of hero cards and aspect cards. For villains, a lot of times we'll very much go the hero route where we're trying to make things feel very thematic and kind of build everything around that. So when you're designing, this is a question for me, uh, when you're designing uh, cards, uh, what is being worked on at, at once, right? So like we know Captain America is the first hero pack and he's coming with leadership cards. Mm -hmm. So are you working on the entire pack at the same time? Um, and if so, do some of the leadership cards in that pack uh, necessarily draw their thematic inspiration from Captain America? Like, are you designing leadership cards in that deck to make Captain America do something Captain America, even though it might not be in a signature pool? Oh, very much so. When we, when we design a uh, pack as a whole, 
we really think we expect a lot of people will just you know buy the the Captain America pack off the shelf, for example, open a box, play with that deck, and then never break it down, never do any deck building. A lot of people don't want to go through that. Um, and so we very much want that to be a uh, thematic moment. We want to tell a story with that deck. Uh, and so when we're creating, when we're designing the, the Captain America cards, we are looking at them in conjunction with his leadership cards, with his basic cards. We're also simultaneously looking at those cards in conjunction with the greater pool. So for Captain America, he comes with leadership. How do the cards in his leadership you know, kit compare with the ones from the core set and the ones at a later date. Um, so we're trying to keep everything in mind, but at the end of the day, we really want the deck that you play with to feel like it, it tells a story in and of itself. I think that's probably one of our top priorities. That's really cool. I dig that. Uh, Norens wants to know, might there ever be dual characters? And by that, he means uh, hero and villains like Venom, uh, who maybe have the ability to be a hero or also a villain. Same sure. Part. I mean, that, that's something we've discussed. Uh, I can't say for you know certain if that's what we'll do, but it's definitely a conversation we've had. So it's, uh, it's nice. an option. Uh, Alex wants to know, how much research, days, weeks, months, do you have to do for each character slash villain? How long do you play test the new cards for? Oh, um, it really depends on which character. Some characters we just naturally know more about. Captain America, for instance, Caleb Grace was the primary developer on that. He knows everything there is to know about Captain America. Uh, I was primarily on Miss Marvel. I didn't know nearly as much about Miss Marvel, so I had to do a lot of research on her. Um, usually we're researching over the, the course of the months that we're developing these cards. Uh, as far as playtesting is concerned, I can't give an exact time frame, but we playtest all the cards for a long time. We make sure that they kind of are run through a rigorous process and that they are uh, really well balanced, that we're happy with them overall. It's, it's uh, a process that we, we try to constantly refine and, and really keep um, um, focused you know, to make sure that everything turns out the best that it can be. Nice. Uh, Volantri wants to know, it's interesting that with four aspects, there are only three types of resources. What was the design choice between the two? So with the three resources, um, we kind of just felt like those were the three sort of standard representations of what heroes do out in the world. They, the physical resources, in a way, kind of represent you know the, the physical power of a lot of heroes, the super strength, the super speed. The mental resources represent either the mental uh, abilities, psychic capabilities, or just you know the intelligence that a lot of these situations require for the heroes to have to, to solve. And then the energy just represents a lot of their abilities, their powers, their energy blasts, but even something like uh, gamma radiation or anything like that. Um, and we talked about, I think at some point there was discussion of maybe a fourth, but it just never quite fit in place. We, we felt like having a wild there to sort of fill in the gaps was enough. Uh, for the aspects, those really came down to just specific play styles that we wanted to have. I know that early on we decided that, you know, um, you, we needed an aspect where you could just beat up on the villain. That was aggression. We needed an aspect where you could kind of prevent them from throwing too much threat on the scheme. That was justice. We needed an aspect that would help, you know, kind of control the boar, prevent damage, uh, heal people. That was protection. And then the last one really came about uh, the leadership was, I think we knew we wanted other aspects. We wanted enough play styles and stuff. But uh, I believe there was a comment early on about, oh, I just want to have a team. I want to play with a lot of heroes at once. And we're like, well, let's make an aspect for that because that appeals to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and once we had those four in place, uh, like I said before, we kind of explored a fifth. It didn't quite work out. Uh, we just felt the game was stronger with those four aspects and, and just three reasons. Three hundred times. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Michael wants to know, what villain would be your favorite to create and why is it Mr. Sinister? <laughs> it's Mr. Sinister because I actually don't know a whole, whole lot about Mr. Sinister. I probably I, he's like he's now the metal some, guy, right? He got some reading to do. Yeah, I think so. Or maybe he's not that. I, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll learn. I'll learn about him. Uh, but my favorite villain to create would actually be Venom. I like Venom a lot. He's I like yeah, hearing that. He's just he's 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 kind of silly. He's got his long tongue and his symbiote that moves around. But he's just a fun fun uh, character in general. So I think I'd really like him. Yeah. And Spider Man's your favorite, so that's mm -hmm. a classic. Yeah, I would, I would only play Spider Man against Villain. Uh, that's that's all right. I would. If you could, if yeah, if I could. live your dream. Uh, YOLO says, Have you considered different versions of heroes, like releasing a new version of Spider Man in the future? Uh, I, that's a discussion we've had. Um, I can't really say whether we'll go that route or not, but it's, it's something we've thought about. Yeah. I mean, e even in the rules, it references the fact that you could have two heroes with the same like hero title but a different alter ego title sure, yeah. uh, that in in play i think that's even called out in the mm -hmm. book so yeah well, it's, it's something we could certainly explore if we yeah, wanted like, to give us miles 
<laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people yeah. would like to see Miles Morales. Uh, let's see, next question here. Eric says, just opened and played Marvel Champions Solo. With this game, are you making and, making and keeping solo play in mind during the design process? We are. Um, we have a lot of discussions about how solo relates to multiplayer, though. We know that solo mode is just naturally swingier, uh, which is a little unfortunate, but we really designed this game to be a multiplayer experience. We want people to sit down with their friends. We want people to sit down with their family. Um, and we, we really expect most people are going to play this in two-player or three-player. So at the end of the day, that's kind of the experience that we're, we're going for. Um, but solo is a, a type of you know, play that we want to encourage people to do. So we're always trying to make sure that solo is viable and that it's fun and it's exciting. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the two- and three-player games are really our, our main goal. Yeah, cool. I know a lot of people love this in solo play. I think it's, oh, yeah. I think it holds up. It, I, I think it does too. Like sometimes you'll get those moments where a, a lot of threat is thrown on the scheme or you take a lot of damage. Um, but I think knowing that beforehand lets you sort of anticipate it in your deck building and, and your play as well. Nice. Uh, next question is from, looks like YOLO again. YOLO Dog. <laughs> That's the name. YOLO, <laughs> Yolo Dog 2000 gets the award for most amazing the best name. chat name. Uh, how do you approach heroes which don't have a separate alter ego? Um, so examples like Thor, which has been announced as coming. Um, you may not be able to speak to this, but how do you handle something like that? It's something, you know, we, we've discussed this quite a bit. There are quite a few heroes that sort of run into this type of situation. So uh, it's something that we have, uh, we, we've talked about, we've kind of solved, and I think people will probably be pleasantly surprised when they see our, how you're handling it. How we handle it, yeah. Yeah, because you were saying uh, in a, the Q&A yesterday that the alter ego element of the game is so critical. Oh, yeah, yeah. That just not having that happen felt wrong. Yep. Um, so you have to solve it, and you're, you seem pretty confident that yeah, you guys Yeah, I think it, it, it works really, really well. Cool. Uh, next question here. I lost it. The chats are rolling through now. Uh, <laughs> here it is. Jared asking, Wrecking Crew is interesting in that it seems the scenario is playable out of the pack without the core set. Is that something that's planned to often happen, or just how uh, Wrecking Crew came out when designed? I think it depends on the specific villains that we're fighting, the specific scenario. Um, for Wrecking Crew, we tried for a little bit to make it work with the standard set because the standard set in a lot of ways is so critical to villain functionality, just the basic attack and basic scheme functions. Uh, excuse me. Uh, but, you know, having the way that Wrecking Crew operates, it was really hard to, to get that to function correctly, adding the standard set in. So. Uh, we ultimately decided just to take it out to compensate for that lack of uh, scheme and attack functionality elsewhere in their card pool, and um, it kind of created a situation where you could just play it right out of the box. Uh, and I think going forward, it really just depends on the scenarios and the villains that we're fighting against. Sometimes it's going to warrant that, sometimes it's not. Yeah, and I mean, it is nice that you can just buy a pack and play against it, but at the same time, uh, one of the big upsides to the game is the modular stats. Yes. So the ability to have a varied experience every time you play a scenario mm -hmm. is, is pretty cool. So I, li I like that. The main thing I like about it is that you're showing with, between Goblin and Wrecking Crew how crazy you guys can go. Yeah. You yeah. gave yourself a lot of space to do crazy stuff. Um, and I, I'm excited to see what you do with some of the villains down, down the pipeline. So next question here is from Kimochi. Uh, Kimochi. How do, you, how do you balance heroes with future cards since they have to keep their 15 signature cards? Oh, um, it's actually not not too difficult to keep them balanced. I think uh, a lot of times, you know, whenever we're making, I use Miss Marvel sometimes as the example. Miss Marvel's ability is really strong. Whenever she plays an attack, thwart, or defense event, she can exhaust to pull it back to her hand. Uh, so as you know, time goes on and we're creating more events that have those traits, we very much have to keep in mind how those things might be used in previous heroes, but. I don't think we've ever really run into a situation where things just totally felt out of place or felt totally unbalanced. Uh, we're always trying to make sure that we play the old with the new and that we're kind of keeping the grand scope of, of everything in mind when we make new cards. And it's, uh, it's usually a pretty fluid process. It's not too tricky. Nice. Uh, let's see. Bob wants to know, what are the elements that determine whether a modular set is difficulty one or higher? So the difficulties of the modular sets, they are a bit, uh, for the core set we felt like it was a, we felt like we needed suggestions for players who, you know, were maybe not so familiar with LCGs or even cooperative games in general. Um, but beyond the core set, we don't explore the whole uh, difficulty rating all that much. 
uh, we kind of leave it up to the players. If you play against a set and you feel like it's extra challenging, then you know that you can include it in a different scenario later and it'll give you that challenge. I, I think to a certain extent it's nice to let players explore that and really find. Also too, something that might be challenging to one player is not as challenging to someone else. So um, throwing on those ratings sometimes feels a little bit arbitrary depending on who See, you ask. You don't have a, like a systematic way of doing that. Yeah, not necessarily. Yeah, we would just kind of leave it up to people to explore yeah. and have fun with. And I presume certain uh, modular sets would get more difficult with certain villains. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah d depending on the, the combos and stuff in there, you can definitely, some modular sets you might play in one scenario and it's not that hard, and then you put it in the next scenario and you're like, wow, this really kicked me in the face all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, Scott is asking, it seems that the heroes having signature cards gives you freedom to create cards you might not otherwise put in the aspect slash basic sets. Is that the case? And oh, yeah. are there any good examples of that from the course now? I think, honestly, if you look at just, um, even if you just look at like Spider-Man, swing web kick, three resources for eight damage is super efficient. Um, and that's probably not a ratio you would find on an aspect card with just that. Like if it, if it were to do that, it would probably do something else, some other hidden cost, something you'd have to, some hoop you'd have to jump through. Yeah. So when we are making these hero cards, we want them to be the most impactful and exciting cards to play. If you draw that hand of cards and you see your hero cards and you see the aspect cards, you should feel usually compelled to play those hero cards. Those yeah. are your, your bread and butter. Those are the really cool ones that are assigned to you. So it, it lets us kind of push the power, do really innovative and exciting things, and also things that we know will never be abused somewhere else. It's kind of nice to know that I can make 15 cards that'll work really well together but I don't ever have to worry about anyone cherry picking any one of those effects yeah. and breaking the game with it. And them if that hero breaks a game in a certain way, they're the hero that gets to do that. Exactly. Which is hopefully exactly. thematically inspired. That's their A thing, good yeah. example of this, and we can pull this up, Bryce, uh, from the Captain America signature set is the Super Soldier Serum. Sure. So it's two cost. It says resource, exhaust it to generate a resource. Mm -hmm. So when you compare this to like Helicarrier, that's three cost reduces by one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're paying basically 33% less mm -hmm. for the effectively the same benefit. You can't give your friend this, right? I don't think. Um, Helicarry can let you, re the next card that gets played is reduced. So yes. you can pass yep. it over to your friends. Um, but this is a pretty good example of, if on an efficiency curve standpoint, it's definitely more efficient than mm -hmm. uh, Helicarrier. Um, but at the same time, because there's two in, in the deck, we were talking about this on stream a bit, mm -hmm. uh, it really seems like it ends up meaning that uh, you just can put less resource cards in a Captain America deck. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not really bust anything, right? But this is a very particular, he gets this, this is his kind of, re in the same way Spider-Man has the web shooters, yeah. right? It's one yep. for three resources, but then mm -hmm. it runs out, which is perfectly thematic for the <laughs> nine. It makes me feel like the 90s Spider-Man. Sure, Because yeah. like in the cartoon, it's, uh, you'd yeah. always run He's out. the best one. Always, right? It's like the... <laughs> It, he's always running out of it, right? This yeah. is the, the, the crux of it. I remember somebody, he's like swinging in the middle of the air, and then he starts falling. Oh, no. Oh, no. And yeah. he grabs onto the wall, <laughs> has to crawl away, and go find some more web shooter stuff. Um, all right, so let's see. Questions rolling in. I'm going to have to catch these. Uh, Brad wants to know, how concerned as a designer are you with power creep? Do you design difficulty based on the core set or cards you know that will be coming in the future? We're always trying to keep power creep in mind. I think that's true for probably any card game ever. Um, we we don't want to we don't want to make players feel compelled like they have to go out and buy these new heroes and these new aspect cards. Uh, so whenever we're designing something, we're always looking back to the core set to make it sure it's relatively balanced. However, there are lessons that we've learned since the core set that kind of help us refine our design um, and do things maybe a little bit better than we did in the past. So uh, we are always kind of looking to the past to make sure that what we're doing is still relevant to people who might just have the core set. Uh, but we're also, you know, trying to keep that in mind in conjunction with everything else. Nice. Uh, someone was asking uh, how many copies of Heroic Strike from the Captain America signature pack are in the pack. For those unaware, it's a three cost event, hero action attack, deal six damage to an enemy. If you paid for this card using a physical resource, like off of his super soldier serum, you stun the enemy. There's three copies. I'll just answer that one for you. <laughs> Um, so that's interesting because you, you said swinging web kick was three for eight. Mm -hmm. So Cap has a three of card that's three for six, potentially with a stun. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do you value damage versus other things like stunning? Is, mm -hmm. is there an equation? You have a math, a, a chart in the background with you know how to value cards and damage and all that, or how, is it kind of more organic? It's a, it's a bit more organic. Whenever we are making a new card, specifically a, a hero specific card, uh, we're not necessarily looking at that card just by itself. We are looking at that card in relation to the hero as a whole. 
Uh, we might make, for example, we could make an event that is very, very powerful in its damage, but when you look at the hero stats, they don't do as much. And then when you equate that to other heroes, they stand up relatively the same because of just how things play out. So we're always trying to keep things uh, balanced kind of across the board. And in the case of that, uh, the three for six, three for six and then a stun is really good, but you do have to spend that physical. There are times where you're gonna have the hand, you're like, I wish I could do the stun. I don't have the physical though. Maybe you haven't got your super soldier serum down yet. Or maybe they're already stunned. Or maybe they're already stunned as well. So sometimes it, it feels much better than swinging web kick, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's kind of our goal is just to make these interesting decisions and sort of balance them with the hero kit as, as a entire package. Yeah, and you can, you can see the layers being peeled back, right? Because three for eight, Right, and three for six with a stun is close. Yeah, similar. I think similar values, uh, but then even the reality of like how many copies they get mm -hmm. changes. So like Cap has three of those. So later, even one you know, new hero having a three for six with a stun, mm -hmm. but only one copy of it. Yeah, is a, already kind of a different identity. Big play style on. difference yeah. for sure. Um, all right. So next up, any Marvel Cinematic Universe vi movies that you're really looking forward to? Oh, that I'm looking forward to. I or mean, any of the content they're making, like the shows and stuff. Yeah, everything I've heard about sounds really great. Um, uh, so I'm super excited for the uh, next Spider-Man movie because I love Spider-Man. And I think they've done a phenomenal job with um, the Tom Holland version. Um, really, I mean, anything that comes out, I'm going to go watch it, <laughs> to be honest. I got my girlfriend on the Marvel train. She wanted to watch uh, uh, Endgame. But she hadn't seen anything else, so we oh had to watch my. like years of content to get up to that point. And I'm about to rewatch as well. Was, yeah. was it worth it? Was uh, it? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It was definitely it was cool seeing it with everything, you know, kind of in perspective now and yeah. understanding how it all builds up. It definitely kind of changed my expectations a little bit. I remember things very differently the first time I saw them to, compared to when I saw it again. So. Um, if you haven't done that, I would suggest it. It's kind of cool. Did any movie get way better or worse in your mind on the reviewing? Uh, the first Captain America, I remember when I, when I saw that in theaters, I was blown away. I was like, oh, this is really cool. When I watched it again, I enjoyed it quite a bit, but I think there are other movies that I like better at this point. It's really fine. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it, a decent origin story and it's enjoyable. Yeah, but like, it was action-packed and stuff, yeah. but th there were some moments where I like I distinctly remember being in the theaters and seeing that and be like, oh, that's awesome. And then it happened when I was watching it at home and I was like, oh, that was cool. That was awesome. I, I just think I've seen so many cool things at this point. Yeah. Maybe I'm not as... I mean, when you compare it to Winter Soldier and yeah. Civil War yeah. and the Avengers movies, it's like... It's still it's a, a good movie, level. but just yeah. in relation, it's... Do you, in a similar vein, right? So you go back and you watch them. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about going back to older designs. So, sure. uh, you know, as far as we can tell from the Q&A last night, you guys are working pretty far in advance on the, on the content. Mm -hmm. um, so now coming back, the course that's actually out, this is what people are talking about and experiencing. Uh, are there any cards or mechanics or designs that, you know, looking back, you have a fresh perspective on? Yeah, I think um, I think I said last night, like looking at the the justice kit and the core set. For the core set, it works really well, but there are some things that maybe in retrospect I would have done differently. Um, sometimes there are certain hero cards and stuff. Uh, as an example, She Hulk has one copy of Gamma Slam. I kind of wish we had given her two because I think there are times where you'll get down to low on hit points and you're just like, I just need to draw that last Gamma Slam. Um, and it's something you want to see her do more. Often. Exactly, it's just a very exciting moment. So. Uh, I think those moments have really, we, we've learned quite a bit since, since the core set, and I think we've really refined our, our processes, and um, we think about the game a bit, you know, when you're making a core set, you are still learning about what the game is and what it can be, um, and we've definitely gotten to that point now, so uh, we're always trying to keep those lessons in mind moving forward. Yeah, it's got to be tough. That's got to be real tough. Uh, let's see, next question. What factors do you consider when choosing to make a character a hero or an ally? I really think that a lot of it comes down to, we wanna, we wanna throw out uh, heroes in this, this first wave that we feel like are uh, both iconic, but also just really um, pull people into the comic books. Uh, so Captain America is one we felt was very iconic. Miss Marvel, we felt, was one maybe that was a little less known, but really pulls people into the to the comic universe, um, and that's really how we've decided going forward. We we like offering groups of heroes. We like to be able to make sure that people can play in their team, that they can kind of tell these stories, and that defines a little bit of the heroes that we choose. As far as allies are concerned, a lot of times the allies that we pick are in relation to whatever hero deck they're going to be in. Um, 
and uh, we're always trying to make sure that there's just a good spread and balance of allies in the same way that we're trying to make sure there's a good spread and balance of heroes that you've got some iconic people Daredevil comes into play and you're like, oh, I know who Daredevil is, but maybe, you know, another ally comes into play like uh, Tigra. You're like, oh, I'm not really familiar with her. Let's go read the comics and kind of learn more about it. Or Google or watch yeah. a whatever on it. Any of that stuff, yeah. Um, so that's kind of related to the next question here, which is uh, from Norens. And he says, are the comics the main source for the characters and powers and design? Or the animated series or the movies or some combination? It's, it's predominantly the comics. Uh, we definitely... I mean, to say that we're not influenced by what is in the popular culture would be, I think, misleading. Where we have our experiences with the movies and the TV shows and stuff, and we know that a lot of people come to this game with those expectations. Um, but at the end of the day, the comics, those are our source material. And if there is ever a confliction of what is happening in the comics and what is happening in you know, the, the greater media, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes it does, we always go the route of the comics because yeah. that, that's what we're trying to stay true to. But most of the time we have the freedom to sort of lean into both. And the, you know, I mean, the movies themselves obviously are inspired by the comics. Yes, so you're kind of working from so. the same original DNA, mm -hmm. even if it's not quite panning out the same. Yeah, we yeah. want to give people the things that they really want to see, but at the same time we want to give a lot of new things too. Yeah. Uh, Finn, is there a possibility of team-up cards as an example, like a fastball special with Wolverine and Colossus? Sure, it, it's something we've discussed. It's something that I've heard a lot of people say that they want. So it's it's a design space we could like explore. people ricocheting stuff off Cap Shield. Yeah, or yeah. That I kind think of it's thing. there's so many different things you could do. So yeah, it's 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 something we we've talked about. Yeah, um, a question for me. I, I noticed as I'm looking at the Captain America cards here. So. Obviously, he has his ability when uh, the setup ability with Steve Rogers to go get Captain America's shield. Mm -hmm. um, it says restricted, max two restricted cards per player. Uh, Captain, he gets plus defense retaliate. But then he has other cards like, um, let me find it here. Shield block um, is another card. Interrupt defense when you would take any amount of damage. Exhaust Captain America's shield, prevent all that damage. And I, I, I assumed when we saw this preview for the first time that... There would be a number of cards in his pool that exhausted the shield. Mm -hmm. And one of the balancing mechanics would be the fact that you can only exhaust his shield once around. Sure. Um, but as I'm looking, I think that's the only card in the deck that exhausts the shield. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something like that. Uh, I presume maybe in the future we could get more cards that are like exhaust Captain America's shield uh, to do some kind of special effect. That's maybe something we could explore. I from what I remember, um, I was very much ancillary to the development process of Captain America, but from what I remember, there were more cards that did that, uh, but it ultimately just created, sometimes it was more frustrating than it was fun. You're like, oh, I, I have these three effects, they all exhaust, I gotta pick one, and now I can't do the other things on my turn that I really wanna do. So when it came down to the shield block card, preventing all damage is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of felt like only being able to do that once per round was maybe important, but a lot of the other effects that exhausted, we kind of felt maybe it was a little more fun and, and empowering, which is something we really want to do uh, to maybe not have it exhaust as much. Sure. I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, I, yeah I it, it makes it easier it. to play stuff, which yeah, I think is that's, pretty That's important. a clever way to kind of restrict a card because you have to have it in play and it has to be unexhausted, mm -hmm. so it's kind of limit once per round. Um, but I think you could go overboard on that. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it's ah, very every easy. Card to Sometimes you get this. just a couple effects and then you draw that hand and you're like, oh, this is not, not as exciting as I thought it was going to be. Uh, Yolo Dog. So we're gonna. This is gonna be the last question. Okay. Uh, and then we're From gonna Yolo cut Dog. out of here. From Yolo Dog 2000. <laughs> I felt like it was a the good end. Best here. name. Everybody else has good names too, but Yolo Dog. Yolo Dog. I mean, it's just committed to it. Uh, <laughs> do you think there is room in this game for some form of PvP, player versus player? The example provided is maybe even somebody playing as the villain against the other players. Uh, it's design space that I could potentially see us exploring. Um, I. Uh, I can't really talk about whether we would 100% do it or not do it, but it's 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 an interesting idea, and I've heard people bring it up before, so I could I could see it happening. Awesome, Michael. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on. I'll give you a handshake on that yeah. one. Everyone watching, thank you so much for watching. A couple things I want to make you aware of, uh, Bryce. You can pan to the shot. Uh, we have uh, obviously Green Goblin, FFG recently announced Goblin, Captain America, Miss Marvel coming out all once in January. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, we have a subscription service. You can sign up to automatically get those delivered to your door. No pre-orders, don't pre-pay in advance, they just show up automatically, it's pretty nice. 
Um, we also have our Cosmic Tokens, which are compatible with Marvel Champions. You can see them here. Uh, and we are releasing a special edition uh, Goblin-inspired set of tokens, threat tokens, next week. So keep your eyes out for that. And uh, thank you all so much for watching and for supporting what we do. We couldn't do any of this without everyone who's signed up for subscriptions and bought tokens from us and coming out to events. We're at Marvel Champions this weekend in Covenant, mm -hmm. Covenant Tulsa. Coming out to events like that. So we really do appreciate it. And again, shout out to Fantasy Flight Games both for an incredible game, to all the designers for making the incredible game, uh, for sending you and allowing us to create this kind of content and have a weekend doing this kind of stuff. And then, of course, for providing all the previews that we've been showing off all weekend. So uh, everyone out there, thanks for watching. Enjoy the game. And I cannot wait to see wherever it is the, the designers are going to take <laughs> us on this journey. I'm so, excited, too. Till next time, keep playing, and we'll catch you next time.